Hey Jeff. Hey Eric. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? Doing well, thank you. The other day, I went outside because I had to replace our dish scrubber. Mm-hmm. You know, for the pots and pans, mm-hmm. like to keep a tidy household. Mm-hmm. And um, I yeah, went there's to- one thing I know about you. <laughs> You love a tidy household. Just fastidiously tidy. Mm-hmm. Went to this place called Face Values and Beyond. Which is the worst name. <laughs> well, is it though? It's such a depressing... I mean, like, yes, no, it is... I go it's there... It's a Bed Bath & Beyond outlet. Yeah. But it is so just like... It's like the Old Navy to the Gap or, or to Banana Republic, right? Sure, but it's also like just the most unimaginative name. Like, imagine the corporate... I think it actually fits. Meeting. Which, I'm not going there to buy a chandelier. I understand. Well, okay, <laughs> sure. But if you are going to go get a chandelier, you get it at face value, <laughs> well, you know? Yeah, or beyond. Yeah. And so um, I went there, and this is the weird part. I walked in there, and I'm on a mission to go get the scrubber, and I realized that they're still playing the same music that they would had it not been like a world-ending pandemic. Oh, so it's like still just like... Holiday. It was, yeah, it was, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm just like, you know, Celebrate. moving down the aisles, just mm-hmm. like trying to find, you know, what I need. Just if like, we took a holiday. Yeah, basically, it gets me like in the mood to like, just like pull anything off the shelf. I'm like, fuck it. Like, let me get some, you know, whatever, you know. A chandelier. A chandelier. Yeah. <laughs> At face values or beyond. Yeah. And beyond. And beyond. Not just, yeah. It's not the choice. <laughs> it's, you know, it's not face value or... <laughs> Beyond, it's face value and beyond. Yeah, if you go to uh, facevaluesandbeyond.com and type in the code, it's the real. Oh, this is an ad. You get a free chandelier included in your in your purchase. Oh wow! Yeah, what so, a deal. Anyway, yeah, Jeff, uh, we have a really great podcast today. We enjoyed all three of these conversations, starting with Sean Fennessy, the head of content for The Ringer, previously at Grantland, previous to that at Vibe Magazine. Where did you go to high school? Uh, in Long Island somewhere. Mm -hmm. Jeff, I love this conversation because it straddles all of our interests, you know, from, uh, Timbaland and Swiss Beats to different movies. He's very intellectual. He's very thoughtful. He is a great authority for pop culture and sports. And this is a, a terrific conversation to not only talk about like Fade to Black, but also talk about what the what the future of the film industry looks like on set and will there be theaters? I mean, there's a lot going on in this conversation. Yeah, it's terrific really good. Conversation. I will say not all of my interests. Oh? I mean, we didn't talk about like, I don't know. Uh, Colorado Rockies oh. from like 1994. <laughs> we didn't talk about yeah. like yeah. We should have talked about the state of the Mets, which is also a very very uh, dim world. I so. mean, he is a huge Mets fan, as are you. Yes. and uh, you know, we could have talked about A Rod and and J Lo. There's there's so much to talk about. We should get him back on the. podcast. We should get him back on the podcast, Jeff. Next up, we have we have Mary H K Choi. Mary H K Choi, the. I think million time New York Times bestselling author. If it's not a million, it's definitely nine hundred ninety nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine. <laughs> she is another very thoughtful, very brilliant voice. They also crossed over, no? When they were, did they I, both work at Vibe? I don't think she worked at Vibe. Oh, she worked at Double XL. Yes, but we don't so even maybe talk they about were that rivals. today. Oh my God! Yeah, I hope it's okay that we put that's them on the same always, episode. That's always weird. Um, but yeah. uh, no, Mary. Mary is a perspective that we haven't had on this on this podcast just yet in terms of like how she's handling her creativity as well as her anxieties. And uh, you know, moving forward through all this is is there's no perfect blueprint to any of this. And I think that uh, one cool thing from all of these episodes is to hear all these different voices. Mary's is just one of our favorites yep. and I was so happy. Her vocabulary is the best. It, it is like the best. Like her use of language yeah. is just like, as I, as I, as I have like a loss of it words, is, just like, it's just, she just, she puts me in my place. Yes. Well, yeah. I think she puts us all in our place, but uh, we love the place that she's in, and we love Mary. Wow, and, what a segue. And then, Jeff. Then we have Black Trey on the podcast. Black Trey, another great intellectual, another great voice in uh, the sports world, and uh, he's part of the Count the Dings family, part of the Count the Dings universe, mm-hmm. but also he's a teacher, a school teacher down in Arizona, so we're talking about like... The Jordan documentary, and we're talking about, you know, new kids finding out who Michael Jordan is, but we're also talking about those same kids being on the other side of a Zoom and uh, the realities of what that teacher-student relationship looks like as we near the end of the school year. Great conversations today, Jeff. All three. But before we get into them, we should note. We should note that patreon.com slash it's the real is where you can go to help support us and this thing. 
if you believe in what we're doing, yeah. which is I think that we're chronicling some incredible conversations with some incredible minds. Yeah. And if you want to invest in that, if you want to invest in us, you can always go to patreon.com slash it's the real. Yeah, I think that the broader idea of who we are is that we're storytellers. And I think that now is an essential time for storytellers. You know, you talk about the lies that are spewed by everyone in the White House, starting from the guy acting as president on down. You talk about uh, his idea of fake news. You talk about like facts out there. I think that what we are doing really is important to history. And I think it's important uh, to not only us, but to all of you out there. And again, like Jeff said, if you support this, if you want to see this move forward in any form or fashion, go to patreon.com slash it's the real. Yeah, I mean, like we are uh, doing a Zoom call with our Patreon followers. Uh, that's tomorrow on Sunday. Um, we are also going to be sending out t-shirts. We're also going to be sending out um, stickers. There's a whole bunch of stuff that we give back to people who give to us. So yes. uh, please go to patreon.com slash it's the real. Jeff, let's now get on the phone with Sean Fennessy. Beep, boop, boop, beep, 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 beep. Hello. Sean! What up? <laughs> wow. Yeah, a lot of energy. Wow. Coming in hot. <laughs> Sean, how are you holding up? I am holding up very well. How are you holding up? We're, we're also doing very well. Yeah, pretty well. I mean, like, we started a daily podcast, which is <laughs> yeah. the worst decision. <laughs> we went from a weekly podcast to just overextending ourselves. Sean, uh, with the ringer's focus on sports and pop culture, what were your first thoughts when you found out that sports and pop culture were uh, no longer allowed to exist? Time to get creative, yeah. I think, was the first thing that occurred to me. I don't know. I wouldn't say I was scared. I was certainly concerned, and it required a lot more conversation. It's not ideal. It's not ideal when you're working on a sports and pop culture site. Yeah, I, I think what's been really cool has been how you guys doubled down on, on nostalgia. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I, I talked to my boss, Bill Simmons, about this about a month ago when things started to seem like this this could be a pretty extended period. And we watched a lot of other outlets pivot towards nostalgia because, frankly, that's all that we have in our lives at the moment sure. is remember, remembering what our lives used to be like. And the that's not, that that's not entirely them. true. We also have horse on, uh, on ESPN. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to comment on the horse <laughs> broadcast. Uh, but, but yeah, when Bill and I were talking about the nostalgia thing. And the truth is, is that you know, going back to Grantland when I first started working for him, um, nostalgia was always kind of a key aspect of what we did. We were always doing oral histories. We were always doing lists. We were always doing look backs at things that we cared about or we felt like people should know more about. Yeah. So I think we're fortunate that we're in a position uh, to keep making stuff. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very, very, very grateful that not only what we try to do is possible, but that um, people still seem interested in what we're doing. Yeah. You know, uh, Sean, you spent a number of years um, in the early aughts editing and writing music uh, or writing about music for, for Vibe magazine. Did you ever envision a scenario in which Swiss Beats and Timbaland would be at the center of culture 10 or 15 years <laughs> past their apex? <laughs> Wait, are you you guys are saying they're past their apex? I, I, First of all, I would never. <laughs> this would uh, this, this is incredibly rude. Yeah, it feels like this is going to drive us apart. We can agree that that Tim had like his golden years from like ninety seven to like two thousand and like seven or eight or nine, right? Whenever he did the stuff with Nelly Furtado, <laughs> that was that was a peak. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, those are jams. I, I'm not, I will not be criticizing any any Tim and Nelly record. Uh, do you, who do you have, Tim or Swizz, who in, in your in your lifetime Hall of Fame? Uh, I would say Timbaland. Yeah, I would. Well, yeah, I think that I do think that Swizz is very underrated, though, and he is important. Like, let's yeah. not like you know say say that he's not. But I think that Tim is is the guy. I think yeah. like, he like, he ch he changed the sound in a way that just was like mind blowing, literally mind blowing for me. But do you think that Swizz is still capable of making a relevant record in a way that Tim maybe isn't? Hmm. Uh, that is that is very hard to say. You know, I think that... Uh, there... when, when was the last record that either of them made that really, like, moved things? Probably, like, uh, you know, with, oh, you, with Drake? Well, maybe. But also, Tim put out the uh, uh, Fuck With Me, You Know I Got It with uh, Jay and Rick Ross. Yep. Um, That's true. Swizz, one that moved everything? I don't even know. 
I mean, I feel like Swizz still has connectivity to to Meek and to Rick Ross, and there's still something happening in the world of Swizz Beats. I don't, I've always had a soft spot for Swizz Beats. I got into a big fight when I was 16 <laughs> uh, in high school, arguing with somebody about Dre versus Swizz Beats. Now, obviously, Dr. Dre is a totemic, yes. hugely important legacy. Artist. It's a big week for Dr. Dre. The Chronic hit streaming services this week. People, yep. people, lots of kids around the country discovering the Chronic for the first time. God bless them. Yes. But um, I don't know. I've always, I've always, I am, a, I'm a DMX man. I've been a DMX man my whole life. Same. And X is not X without Swizz. You know? That that is absolutely true. Yeah. Um, but again, that that did happen 20 years ago. So. Sure. Sure. <laughs> we're, we're talking about nostalgia. You know. <laughs> I'm just happy to have them back into my life. I'm yeah. Happy no. To have, Primo and, and, and Rizza back in my life. I'm happy to have all these dudes who I cared about so, so much for so, so long at the center of culture. Isn't I love that. Isn't that incredible? It, it really crazy. is. Every Saturday night or, or or Monday night, whenever, you know, things well, go Actually, left. Sean, who is a battle or like somebody who has not battled? Like what what is a, a personality that you're just like, man, like I wish that this person got like their chance to shine right now? Hmm. Wow, that's a, that's an interesting. I mean, if you want to go talk about where my head was at 20 years ago, <laughs> it's it's this. I don't think this would be quite the cultural event that we would want it to be, but it would be like MF Doom versus LP. You know, like that really was. There's a very L- specific audience for that. Wait, wait. Yeah. MF, do you think MF Doom is going to be expressive or not on on Instagram Live? Has, I don't, I don't think it would be, be him. Mask. Oh, it has, has to be, to be yeah, yeah, somebody else. Yeah. He, he would send somebody else in his Hannibal place. Hannibal Burns <laughs> yeah. LP, I think, would be the best. Yeah, I don't, I'm, that's a really good question, though. I don't know. I mean, I, I, what I want to see is other heads from other genres coming through here. Like, I really want the Max Martin, Benny Blanco showdown, too. You know, like, why? It's, well, this doesn't have to be a rap thing. Talk well, about uncharismatic <laughs> Swedish producers. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you, yeah, I have yeah. another hit, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sean hosts the Big Picture Podcast, which is terrific and always thoughtful and, and speaks the industry language very well. Um, in, in your estimation, how fast can Hollywood turn their ship? As in, is there enough material uh, in the can for the next six months? Will will Netflix be the primary delivery service moving forward? And, and, and honestly, are we looking at, you know, a, an animation boom to come? Hmm. Well, thanks for saying what you said about the show. Um, I really appreciate that. I think it's a complicated answer. I certainly don't have a a crystal ball on any of this stuff, and I'm only largely reacting on a regular basis to what people in the industry are telling me in my own gut on a lot of it. Mm -hmm. Netflix, obviously, is just super well-positioned. I was told earlier this week that every single film that they have contending for awards this year is already in the can. Wow, wow. Fil- films that they're going to drop in December are in post production right now, and wow. a lot of that post production can happen through the year. That is not true for most films that the other studios are planning to put out by the end of the year. So what Netflix about Quibi? Is obviously, in a power position, <laughs> Quibi uh, is a is a service. I've been told <laughs> that was that was designed That's the rumor. Yeah. Uh, to look at when you're at Starbucks. <laughs> None of us are going to Starbucks anytime soon. It's complicated. Um, Quibi will not be competing for any Oscars. <laughs> That's crazy. That, that, uh, that, that might be the biggest tragedy of all of this. <laughs> I mean, look, honestly, I feel like the, the, the real test is, is Tenet, the new Christopher Nolan movie, mm. which is supposed to come out July 17th. And every Christopher Nolan movie is a mega event in movie theaters. Christopher Nolan is one of the great pro, you know, proselytizers about the theatrical experience. It really means a lot to him that his films get seen in theaters. Yeah. Will Will the country be comfortable going to a movie theater 10 weeks from now? I don't know. I mean, how do you guys feel about it? Uh, I, I miss that, that atmosphere. Uh, I, at first when, you know, when Fast and Furious was like, Hey, we're going to 2021. I was like, Whoa, like that's, that's like sort of on par with like Rudy Gobert, you know, it's like that sort of, uh, earthquake that announces that this is bigger than maybe we had considered it. Um, there is a difference between watching something in the theater and watching something at home. And, uh, should we be prepared for the next year, uh, to do something different that's a scary thought I, I i honestly don't know if i'm ready for that nor nor by the way am i like into the idea of doing a drive-in just to like be around other people but not yeah know? i mean well also like how would that even work in new york oh new york no i who knows yeah but but anywhere else yeah i mean honestly 
at the risk of getting a little doom and gloom about the industry. MF the doom movie, and gloom. Yeah. MF doom. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the industry itself is already in this really strange over leveraged position where all the companies that owned the theaters were in massive amounts of debt. Yeah. All of the studios were trying to find ways to gin up new IP to get m- more people excited about their movies because going to the movie theater just doesn't make as much sense in 2020 when everyone has a smart TV. So many people have big screens in their homes. Many people have subscriptions to tons of services, you know, paying for parking, paying for concessions. You know, wrangling a babysitter, all these things are so much harder for people who've spent a lot of their uh, childhoods and adult lives going to movie theaters. So they were already, frankly, kind of fucked. Yeah. And and so this really shines a light on that problem in a big way. And so for me personally, it's it's just heartbreaking. I I, I, I I've just built so much of my life around this stuff. For sure. And I, I don't know how film sets are going to operate moving forward. You know, like, how are people going to stand six feet away and still, you know, operate a camera and have, like, you know, uh, craft services and have, you know, just actors standing near each other without, you know, basically putting a, a temperature gauge against their head and making sure that everyone's still all right. It's a good point. You know, my buddy, uh, Andy Greenwald, who hosts a show with us, he just uh, produced, wrote, his first series that aired on USA Briar yep, Patch yep. Uh, la- earlier this year. And he was talking recently about how the atmosphere of those sets and the way that actors interact is very physical. You know, it's not, it's not an orgy, but people <laughs> like it, it, in Hollywood, there is like a closeness. There is a kind of physical connectivity on a set that would, I think even surprise people if they didn't know how it operated behind the scenes. And you're right. That's like, that's, that's not going to work going forward, at least not for the next six months. So I don't know. I mean, the other thing to consider that is kind of fascinating, a little bit of a little bit of a mind fuck is, you know, when everything shut down, tons of movies that were in, in production midstream had to stop. Yeah. But the way that the movie industry is organized is over the next two to three years, you've got all of these signposts for other movies that are planned in the future. So you've got a guy like Tom Holland, who's a very hot young actor who's in all the Marvel movies. He's Spider-Man. But all these other filmmakers and studios want to put him in their movies to help springboard their new their new stories. Yeah. But but Tom Holland really has to be in the next Spider Man movie, which hasn't started shooting yet. Which <laughs> means that's first priority when we get out of this pandemic uh, quarantine. So <laughs> whatever smaller filmmaker was making another movie with Tom Holland, that person just got screwed out of the chance to have Tom Holland in their movie because he has to go make a Spider Man movie. And there's going to be a crazy domino effect on everything in the whole industry because of this. So this whole concept of first position, who's in first position on releasing a movie is just going to have a huge outcome on what kind of movies we see for honestly the next five years, man, or maybe even long. I mean, yeah, five years, like the the butterfly effect I wasn't even considering like how long it would go out. Like that's, that's sort of wild. I, I was, um, very bummed out last night. I was watching the reaction to Travis Scott's Fortnite concert and how like, that's the new model possibly for a lot of these um you know for the music industry it's just like well this is going to be a very virtual world going forward well yeah because we've we've spoken to people like uh probably a month ago and and forward about you know venues not wanting to be liable going forward you know yeah i mean I, i will say it dovetails elegantly with my being super washed like I, I, like like i was already i still love music as much as i did when when i first met you guys but i don't have that in-person experience as much with concerts hold with on parties. you're not going to travis scott concerts yeah you don't tag along with john carmonica <laughs> this is this is wild I mean, god bless jc still still hoofing it to shows um i can't I just I need a seat. Like, if there's a signed <laughs> seating at the show, I'm I'm good. I'm in. Is Travis Scott doing a signed seating these days? Yeah. 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 <laughs> is he playing town hall? Where what, what kind of venues is he doing? Yeah, nursing homes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, what um? How was the how was the Travis Scott Fortnite situation? I didn't see it. Well, I mean, like I didn't actually participate because, again, <laughs> like you, I'm an adult. But I um, it was it was like a it was like a video game, you know. But like you had an avatar of yourself, I guess. Um, sort of like near the stage and you could also do like the Fortnite dances to his music and there was a giant Travis Scott <laughs> head but like other than that like it's not a concert he wasn't performing live they were playing his music and he was just like participating as a video game player very weird very weird Sean uh, I loved in particular uh, your dispatches from this year's Sundance 
And, um, you know, Jeff, Jeff nor I attended South by Southwest until people said basically that it was over, you know, just because Doritos had gotten involved. (laughs) They were like, they were like, you know, you guys came too late. You missed out. Did you have a feeling going to Sundance this past year um, that you had, you know, entered a new version of it, that it wasn't the same as the mid 90s Sundance, that you weren't there to discover the next big film like we weren't there to discover the next, you know, rock band out of the panhandle of Oklahoma or whatever? Mm, it's It's a very interesting question. I mean, it's hard for me to compare because I wasn't this was my first Sundance last year. And just given what my focus is with the podcast and a lot of the covers that I do at the company, um, I'm being exposed to a lot of things that have been mythologized to me. Mm. So I can't, I can't say for sure. I mean, it's obvious when you go to park city during Sundance that the festival is huge business now and has been corporatized. And also there's so much more media than there was when, you know, Sex, Lies, and Videotape dropped yep. in in 19, I think it was, it's either 89 or 90. 89 or 90, and, yeah. Yeah, and so that, that sense of kind of discovery that you're talking about, I think is virtually impossible. I think you have to go to smaller festivals to really get that feeling, and there are literally dozens, maybe hundreds of festivals around the country or, every year where or, smaller films are showing. Or there, or there were. <laughs> yeah. Or there were, yeah. I mean, this is a big question. You know, Telluride, Telluride Film Festival is my favorite of all the major festivals. And I, I'm really eagerly anticipating going this year. And at the same time, I don't know if it's going to happen. I mean, Telluride and, um, and Venice and Toronto really set the stage for the Oscar race, which is a big deal for me and yeah. for the podcast. And I mean, September 1st is when it's supposed to happen. By September 1st, will we feel comfortable traveling to another state by plane and sitting in a movie theater for 12 hours a day because that's what I do when I go to those festivals. I'm really not sure. I really don't know how if this will work the same way again. And frankly, I don't think most filmmakers or studios are yet comfortable with the idea of a virtual festival. Yeah, would you would you be against Travis Scott hosting the Oscars on Fortnite? <laughs> <laughs> um, define against. <laughs> would I hate it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think the, the Oscars needs to do everything it can to stay relevant. So if if, uh, if, if La Flame needs to get involved. So yeah, we, yeah. Travis Scott as Billy Crystal. I like that Sean was like, I'm so washed. Meanwhile, you're like La Flame. <laughs> I'm still, I'm still, uh, I'm trying to hold on to remnants of my youth. It's Did you just Google it? <laughs> yeah, is that how you pronounce it? Is it La Flame? <laughs> <laughs> um, Sean, do you have any uh, music documentaries that you can like just fall back into for comfort like these days? Like, do you do you tap into like Standing in the Shadows of Motown or do you check out something like, you know, uh, Muscle Shoals? Or... Yeah, Muscle Shoals. Um, even like the Fire Festival documentaries. Do you do you watch anything like in the music world that really like can like, you know, play in the background or even just, you know, take your mind off of things? I think the best one for that is Stop Making Sense. The mm. Talking Heads documentary mm-hmm. that Jonathan Demi directed. I think it's probably the best concert movie ever made. And it is also the kind of movie that you can put on as wallpaper and then devote five minutes to and then turn away because I know I know kind of the rhythms of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting you ask, though, because, you know, on this day that we're talking, the Beastie Boys documentary, Beastie Boys Story, yes. is out on Spike Apple Jones? TV+. Yeah, Spike is it Jones good? I've seen uh, mixed reviews. You know, I, I I I have seen some mixed reviews too. I feel like people are being a, a, a bit oddly hard on it, and I, I I don't know. I can't really wrap my head around that. Um, I don't. It is certainly not the ten hour buildings Roman f- official story of Beastie Boys. I mean, right. They've squeezed their entire their life cycle into two hours, and the way that it's set up is that it's they basically shot a live performance reading of sections of their book more or less you know it's a kind of like a broadway version of their book but with intermingled with some production aspects some spike jones aspects it's not the wow this is a deeply important piece of cinema kind of experience that you want but i mean it's a it's a movie with 25 beastie boys songs and adam and mike making jokes and telling their story and that just that sort of thing just doesn't happen every day. And I mean, those guys are just really a very, very big deal to me personally. And yeah. it feels like the kind of kind of thing that I, I could just turn on at any moment and get um, get some enjoyment out of. So that's an old one. And that's a new one. For yeah, that. I mean, well, the, the Beastie Boys thing, like the, the only criticism I saw was that it's not Spike Jonesy enough. And mm-hmm. like that people want it to be like this 
genre breaking you know experience that instead is it's it's just on a stage and that's mm. the problem right like i mean like i haven't seen it but i think that that's and by the way uh and i i don't know if you experienced this sean but the the audio version of the beastie boys book was i thought really fantastic yeah i mean that's the thing that book is really dope and really deep and the movie doesn't give you that same sense of depth but what it does do is, is it gives you a more emotional physical connection to the guys mm. specifically there's a moment when ad rock talks about yeah out near the end of the film it's just like it's a very special moment like if you don't feel that and you like that band then there's something wrong with you so I, you know it's not an a plus but i really liked it one last documentary i just uh, i'm curious your take on uh do you have a special place in your heart for fades of black like we do of course yeah I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, an, I'm an adult man who's <laughs> between the ages of 35 and 45. So, yeah, it's a big fucking deal to me. I um, think that, that scene where Tim is, you know, playing, uh, you know, different different loops for Jay is just one of the greatest of all time. Is that when he's clutching the big, big bucket the of juice? juice? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I mean, I, uh, as you guys alluded to before, I'm a big producer nerd. Mm-hmm. And there's very few rap films that capture that sensation of what it's like to see a producer and an artist interacting in the studio. There's a couple of um, incredible versions of it in that movie. Obviously what everything Kanye does in the movie yep. almost like, almost like burnishes his legend in a way. That's like, that, that's the start. <laughs> I think of people being like, Whoa, this guy has got a big ego. Jesus. Yes. Um, but then there's some subtle Pharrell stuff. And then, you know, you do get that great moment when Rick Rubin brings in um, the PC boys to kind of observe yeah. 99 problems. And what am I forgetting? Who else is in there? Um, oh, Just Blaze, obviously, and Just Oh, Just Blaze, yeah, course, Just Just gets shit on for playing too many video games and all of that. But yeah, <laughs> right, it's right. it's really it's significant to us, I think, to a lot of people, and I hope that people can you know revisit that and uh, and get something out of it because uh, you know maybe the greatest living rapper right now could be Travis Scott. So uh, listen, Sean, uh, <laughs> we love you. Uh, thank you for all the podcasting you're doing these days. It really is very meaningful and important. And uh, and here's to the future of cinema, whatever that is. And uh, you know, listen, stay safe out there. Uh, stay creative. And, uh, and until we talk to you next time, be well. Jeff and Eric, shout out to you guys for doing the show the way you're doing it. I appreciate it too. And uh, I hope I can see you guys at some point in the next five years. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sean. Later, guys. Jeff, let's get on the phone now with Mary H.K. Choi. Beep, 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 beep. Hi. Mary! <laughs> <What up? laughs> How's it going? Good. How are you? Oh, my God. It's nice to hear voices. I'm okay. Um, it's it's so weird. I'm, yes. I'm, like, imagining it <laughs> so vividly in the theater of my mind, and that's providing me with tremendous comfort right now. Mary, uh... I think that uh, your tweets have been spectacular, particularly during this time. I know that you had uh, sort of doubled down on Twitter as the social media of choice. And um, there were four tweets that I noted myself that I would hope for a little more context from. So if I could just read them to you and you could just tell me what the bigger idea is. Is that cool? Sure. Absolutely. Mary HK Choice said, bodies are smart, brains are bullies. Yes, I am constantly living in a hostage situation (laughs) where, (laughs) like, my brain is so spazzy. Like, the operating system is haywire. It needs thousands of updates. It's very glitchy. And the browser of my mind constantly has thousands of windows open. Oh, my God. So I just really need to close tab a lot of the time. And when I'm doing that and like getting really fanciful in my brain, oftentimes my body's like, hey, I'm um, a little help here, mm. you know? Mm-hmm. And I, I, have, I definitely think that bodies are super intuitive and our bodies are in the present and our minds are somewhere else. And so I think that when, like, I also am super dissociative. Like, mm. I feel like sensitive people, I feel like, Oh my god, dogs! I miss dogs. <laughs> um, it's not ours. It's in the hallway. So, yeah, yeah. do you want okay. us to get it? It's, it's, it's close enough. <laughs> I'll yeah. kidnap it. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, I just feel like your body can be in the present, and your mind is oftentimes in the past, mm-hmm. um, and like that 
cr- creates depression and or it's in the future and that creates anxiety yeah and your body's just here trying to thrive you know yeah and so i think that when you do things to honor your body you're kind of in a good place well how are you honoring your body while inside <laughs> i am trying to stick to a schedule like i'm an addict and i have an eating disorder and so the whole like focus on food right now, hoarding it, parceling it out is like really challenging. Yeah. And so I just really stick to a routine. Like my meals, there's three of them in a day. I know that's rocket, <laughs> rocket science. <laughs> but meals are really important in that they have a beginning and also an end. Mm. And that's really important for me so that I can get some work done and all that stuff in between. And I do exercise every day. Um, usually it's just like a half an hour and all that is, is to remind my head that I have arms and legs. Yeah, (laughs) It's really inelegant, but that lets me just sort of be in my body. Cause like right now things are pretty intolerable. I hate uncertainty. Yep. And like, since the universe is a shrug emoji with like the only like dispatches we're getting regularly is from this like red person who espouses like putting Lysol in your lungs and all sorts of stuff. So yeah. like, well, he did say to inject it, not to, <laughs> to drink it. But by, by the way, Mary, when I, I got to a point, uh, I don't know how many weeks ago, but when I was watching his press conferences, my body hurt. And so you talk about like the brain and the body, like that really yeah. was allowing that to affect me physically. Also, Eric's been doing hydrochloric, oh, yeah, yeah. something uh-huh. like yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that had a bad effect. Yeah, had a not great effect. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, Mary, another tweet that you said, you said, I am jealous of Seth Rogen's kiln. Yes. Oh my God. Okay. (laughs) I did not know how jealous I would be, but like, so he's been doing amazing work. Like him and his wife have a kiln. Um, like, like, like ghost. Like, yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, like they like pottery. Yeah. yeah I mean, you and know, like thousands of years of pottery. <laughs> yes. But you like boil it down to yeah. Ghost the yeah, movie. The movie, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Demi Moore. You know? Yeah. Totally. And I, I believe I, I don't know if this is fake news, and if it is, it's fine. I choose to believe it's better for personal morale. But yeah. like, I believe they've called it Brad Pitt because it's hot as hell, <laughs> and their glazes are coming out really nice. And I have crockery envy in the fact that they are just focusing on this thing, just is really beautiful to me. And if you came up to me just unsolicited and said, "Hey, I'm going to talk to you about Seth Rogen's pottery," I'd be like. Oh, this is da- stranger danger. But <laughs> secondly, I'd be like, whatever. But they're so good objectively, like in a blind. <laughs> I was about to say in a blind sight test. Yeah. As in, if I didn't know they were like that person, mm-hmm. and you're like objectively judge this vase, I'd be like, oh my god, <laughs> that is a platonic ideal. I really enjoy that. And even in this, like, kicky glaze, it's wonderful. <laughs> and it turns out, you know, it's, like, Seth Rogen. So he's not making, like, shitty, like, ashtrays. Like, he's making beautiful art. Beautiful art, next level. Also, just a supreme sense of, like, satisfaction without the smugness of, you know, the sourdough hive. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it just seems joyful. And I really am... I'm finding so much joy in other people's joy right now. That's because awesome. There's enough grief to go around, but I have spectacular... It's called compersion. Do you know about this? No. It's about, like, joy at other people winning. It's like the opposite of schadenfreude. It's also the opposite of sourdough starter, so, you know. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> sourdough bulls, compersion. Yeah. Uh, it, your, your third tweet, whoa, egg matzah is so tender. So tender. <laughs> Wait, I didn't know. I, I, love, like, I love Mary agreeing with... Like Mary from the past. <laughs> no, totally. Also, the way I make it sound like a great idea that I've never heard of before. Yeah. It's so tender. I didn't realize. Like, I love matzah. Mm-hmm. I, lo- I like a large format cracker. Oh, I was going to say, like, it's sort of against the point to enjoy matzah, right? Like, that's, that's, it's, it's because like. Because it was a bread made of necessity. Yeah. Yeah. It's true, true. I'm not sitting here just like eating, like, <laughs> your people's strength and being like, mmm, tasty. But it's more just like, I like the outside to inside ratio. Because if you dress a matzah, again, probably antithetical to the actual point of like remembering things, but like the, the topping to inside ratio is wonderful. It's particularly so, with the egg. Yeah. Especially yeah. with the egg. And I didn't know it was so tender. And so 
I'm in the store and obviously like I'm a, I'm a normal New York person. So anytime I go into a store, I feel like it's like a threat to my life. Right. And I'm in there holding my breath <laughs> as a normal person. Does. Um, and I see, you know, the matzah cause it was like, this was around Passover, Passover. And I was like, Oh my God, I didn't know it came in egg. And so I bought it and it was such an impulse purchase. And I was like, will I live to rue this? And I <laughs> rue it, I did not. It was glorious. And well, it's it's so, t- I didn't know the sort of, it's still like dry because it's unleveled right. and yep. it is what it is. But it just has this like crumbly texture that is just ASMR. Delightful. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it Wait, really is. What so is good. a purchase that you've made? Because I do respect all of your snack choices, especially. What Thank is you so much? <laughs> of course. I mean, you you that is like part of your brand. Um, it's true. It's like a cornerstone of Mary H K Choi, <laughs> like your identity. But like, what is um what is a, a something that you purchased that you instantly regretted? Mm. That is a very good question. Um, Ding. <laughs> I don't. I'm trying to think of anything that I've regretted purchase wise. There hasn't been a lot. <sighs> you know, all food items are doing their best by the time it crosses my threshold, and so I try to be sort of. You know what? I had a mealy apple, oh. and that was that was like kind of a day ruiner. I don't know why. Yeah, wait. How did you not like pick it out correctly? <laughs> well, okay. So I went to a less frequented grocery situation because I was just, I'm doing this thing also where I'm trying to go to like a lot of, not a lot of different stores, but like trying to like provide money to certain places. Right. So you're not going to Trader Joe's. You're not going to, (laughs) right. Like you're not, yeah, Yeah. no Ralph's. Yeah. 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 And there's no like FOMO aspect to my grocery (laughs) shopping. Um, So I bought this apple and it obviously it looked, it looked like a struggle apple, (laughs) but I had, different designs on it and I put it in the fridge and I like um I fridge my apples I don't know if that's divisive Mm -hmm. but and then I ate it and it was really really disappointing and I really understood why it was that normal like that regularly I don't buy apples from this particular establishment so so you then return to the eight hour line outside of Trader Joe's (laughs) no I returned the apple to the store (laughs) no I, I didn't I didn't alter anything but I did have a little funeral in my heart about my hopes and dreams for this apple and my apple relationship with this particular store that didn't flourish this sounds like but like uh animal crossing yeah <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the turnip prices were trash. <laughs> uh, and and the the last uh, tweet I'd like to mention. You said, "Man, I really miss my life from before. Shit was getting so good. It was getting so good. Then you, you had guys. an apple. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no but but no. It, this is a, a very you know. I I think that is the tweet that defines this time. Yeah, I mean that's the thing. It's like I'm, I sit in March and I'm like, man, I really wish I had my February problems. I'm sitting in 2020, and man, I'm like, you know, 2019 wasn't so bad. (laughs) And as you know, like, the universe has been kind of like a hellfire for several years now. And and with that in mind, it just seems to me that we're still hurtling towards just a latrine of hellishness that I have that was unanticipated. But I guess my point is that there are so many little things that I, I like. I miss such simple things. Like, I miss the subway. Mm. I miss, like, getting off on East Broadway and having a conversation with those kids who always won't let anyone swipe. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I miss, like, such simple things. And, like, I really, you know, I'm, like, I've been on the planet for a while, and I was getting really good at having friends. Yeah. Like, I really loved my friends. And I was really getting good at letting them them know that and not to say that that's changed but like I do miss seeing them and I miss like you know I I started um like really going to therapy a few years ago and really seeking recovery for my eating disorder and my addiction issues a few years ago and so my life is just becoming was becoming just increasingly more beautiful and more technicolor and just kind of awesome and like my work was you know for like I wanted to write a book for like 40 years and then I, yeah. I wrote one and wrote, wrote another and that that part was just getting good too and you know it I guess my only thing is it's really easy to get into a contest of what you're quote allowed to feel bad about like there's so much grief 
there's so much unemployment. There is so much economic insecurity. There is literally people dying by themselves. Like this is just a, just a very, very real and like hardcore time. Yeah. But it doesn't do me any good to for me to be like, well, you're not allowed to feel bad about the fact that, you know, you do, you were about to write a movie script. And yeah. Like it just, it's not going to, it's just on hold for a while or like that all these projects that I had designs on are just going to be on hold for a while. Like it feels crummy if, I, if I'm like apples to apples and like, oh, people are dying and they have no jobs and there's food scarcity and like the food banks are wild. Like, and then I'm just like, man, like Maslow's hierarchy of need. Like <laughs> I'm working on a script. Like I know how gross that is, but just for like 10 or 15 minutes, I'm just letting myself feel gross about it. I think you should. Yeah. yeah. Because um, then I can just, Get, I can just like get over myself and really think about other people. Mary, I'm, I'm curious as to what percentage of your creative efforts while in quarantine have been forced as opposed to free-flowing and inspired. <laughs> That's so nice that you ever think that it's not forced <laughs> prior to quarantine. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like chasing like a naked baby around the house who doesn't want to eat like a bite of food. Like that <laughs> is me and my writer. Like that's our relationship. And, you know, I think that the thing that's been really helpful from a creative standpoint, as someone who works on large scale things, like that makes me sound like I'm like a nature sculptor or something, but like, <laughs> no, no, like, like a like kiln, like, are... like a Seth Rogen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah <totally>. Like, <laughs> like a, a book is big and, if I start thinking like I have to do a certain amount of it by a certain time, it doesn't serve me. And right now, like all March, I could not work. Like I was in grief. Like Mm -hmm. there's some personal stuff going on with my family that was just really tough and remains tough. And I was just in grief and I was in shock. April, I started being able to do like 45 minutes here and there. And I'm just letting that come. Like, I'm kind of treating, like, my writer, like, the goose that lays the golden eggs. Like, if I, like, cut through it with a machete just to get at the gold, it's not going to come. I just have to, like, wait for this thing to poop out this, like, nugget of content. And, you know, that's that's been the only sustainable way to do this without suffering. Because it's it's not, not like, time put in equals time out necessarily. That one-to-one isn't always there i mean and that's not to say that you you shouldn't sit down and actually at least try to do the work like this that part is really really crucial but just not being greedy or too ambitious about work what work comes out has been really good for me yeah well i mean like but what's something that like has made you joyful at all like during all of this like i know that one of the things that um i read was that people are, are being more proactive in terms of their friendships you know like a lot of people are reaching out more um just because of you know either to kill time or because they actually care or whatever it is but like i think that's something that i that i've enjoyed where it's just like i'm reaching out to a lot of people um and by by coincidence you know more people are reaching out to me yeah and that's so nice like before the quarantine i will say that like every time i needed to make a phone call to someone i felt like i was like homiciding them <laughs> like everyone would be like oh my god we didn't set up a time for this yeah. oh my god, what happened? you know and now it's just like usually when my noises get too loud like when i've been in my head too long and i'm getting self-obsessed about something that ultimately doesn't matter the second i reach out to someone and just ask them hey how are you doing mm it's just such a reprieve from just sitting in here off gassing and huffing my own fucking crazy all the time. Yeah. And I love that. I love that. I love like how not shy I've become at calling people. Yeah. And that's really beautiful. And I hope that other people feel the same way. And I find so much joy in WhatsApp voice memos. <laughs> <laughs> Just being like, hey, what's up? Like, it's like they're like sweet little postcards, and they're really beautiful. Yeah. Do they also disappear the way that like iPhone messages do? No. And actually, you know, in iMessage, when you record it and like someone texts you, sometimes it drops, and so you lose like a minute and a half of your most profound, poignant <laughs> thoughts. Yeah. Like it doesn't happen on WhatsApp, and that's really nice. You can keep them. Um, you said that you have, uh, you know, become not shy about phone calls. Do you feel the same way about uh, FaceTimes? 
I think house party has like dulled any humiliation <laughs> that I feel at FaceTime because yeah. also like everyone's kind of like whatever right now. Like I'm so used to seeing my friends and seeing myself without like filters. Yeah. And I mean, it's nice. Like apparently I'm 40 percent more disgusting than I thought in my head <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay and everyone else sort of knows that and so it's fine like I think that too like it's just like universal sort of acceptance that like these aren't our real eyebrows for now right. <laughs> like, <laughs> I think that that's pretty kind too and I kind of love that you know who was like very on the ball for like the past like five years just like ready for uh quarantine fashion was like Cardi B Cause she was just like, oh yeah, like I can put it on, like, but you're also gonna see like the real me, and I don't give a shit, right? Yeah, totally. But you know what I will say about Cardi that I've been wondering? You know how she lives in that like palace house that like they first got lost in a few times? Yes. Yeah, so mm-hmm. with yes. the the gun range in the basement. Yeah, with the gun range. <laughs> Do you think their entire staff lives there? Because Cardi's nails are the only like quarantine nails that are just like on it, right? Uh, They're that's, so spectacular. That is a great question, and we're going to have to sort of investigate yeah. that. I we're going to text you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that would be so important to me. Thank we're going to we're going to WhatsApp uh, voice memo you. <laughs> yes, um, Mary. Uh, we consider you like the quintessential New Yorker, but the truth is that you lived in Hong Kong until you were fourteen, and then you spent your formative years down in Texas. Wait, why does this sound like Eight Mile? No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. But but I, I'm just curious what you think when. Texas's idiot lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, says stupid things like there are some things more important than living when he's talking about reopening up the economy. Oh, totally. I mean, there's a lot of grief that I experience around Texas as a whole. Like, you know, everything that they do for like anti-abortion is so sus. Like just even just like the whole like, you know, sacrificing the elderly for the economy. The whole thing is so unacceptable and just avaricious and 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 like just mind-boggling i bet and and i'm sure that you know a a piece of your heart really does still live down there and there is a pride in where you're from but it's like how could there be such foolishness and assholery you know in that same place i mean that's the thing but like everyone I'm not saying like everyone contains multitude. It's like I can hold space that that person is deplorable and a lot of people there I do not understand Mm -hmm. while also being like, but I love H-E-B and also like Shea Serrano's from there. You know what I mean? There's there's just like, and my parents live there, but like a lot of the legislative stuff does really bother me because my, like my immediate family and my parents are there, my brother and his family are there and like that does bum me out um but yeah it's like everything it's like you know cuomo and fucking prisons yeah yeah and it's just right now it's so incumbent on me to be informed to do what i can to participate in the ways that i can to just have some faith that it will move a needle if i make an effort to make it so but also put it down for a little bit if there's nothing I can do beyond that because yeah. doom scrolling and just really like, you know, creating effigies in my house of these like horrible, horrible, horrible people and then setting them alight and like, just like thinking about that forever and ever just isn't going to serve me or my day. It's yeah. like truly for me, that's how the terrorists win. Yeah. And yeah. like these people are terrorizers and they are, so depressing yeah um but yeah Mar- i yeah. yeah uh one last thing before we let you go which is you know that one of our favorite pieces ever was uh from about a decade ago you wrote it in the new york times about uh the man who helped move you mr juan <laughs> and yes. uh out of like four different apartments or oh five a, or... a million different apartments yeah. and he was always there for you and and just you know he did his job uh a nightmare, I would I would think, would be to move during the quarantine. But if you had to, would Mr. Wan still be your, your first and most trusted phone call? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. One, because, like, there's been so much, like, anti-Asian, anti-Chinese yeah. sentiment. And yeah. so in 
in just appreciation and solidarity for that, I would definitely call the Chinatown movers. Um, also, just to see a friendly face from six feet away with yeah. a mask on. Like, I think that that would be really reassuring. Nice um, sense of normalcy. Totally. Like, me moving again? Totally <laughs> typical. Like, that'd be really nice. Mary, listen, we, we love you so much. Take care of yourself. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I hope that whatever creativity comes out of this, it is uh, strong. I hope it is, is powerful. And I, yeah, I, I hope it's not like a running baby around the apartment. I hope it's more like a dancing <laughs> baby from Ally McBeal. <laughs> We're looking forward to everything that you do uh, in this time period, Mary. We love you. Take care of yourself. And we'll talk to you soon. All right. Yeah, I love you guys. Really appreciate you doing this. It's just such a beautiful act of service and it's keeping so many people together. So thank love you. you guys. Thank you sincerely. Love you. All right. Okay. Bye. Bye. And Jeff, let's get on the phone now with our friend Black Trey. Beep bong bonk. Bing bong. Yo. Trey. What up? What's going on? What's happening? How are you? I'm good. How are my levels? Levels are great. Yeah, I'm killing it. All right. Turn the headphones I want, down. I'm going to troll Waz. That's what, that's what I'm about to say. <laughs> I feel like yo, you're about to start spitting. Yo, Trey, um, and maybe you know this, but apparently Scotty Pippen's watermarked copy of the Michael Jordan documentary has been going around the back channels of the internet. If the copy landed on your doorstep today, would you watch the bootleg in full or would you wait with the, the, the rest of the world until Sunday evening to watch? Uh, no, nah, actually, I, I stumbled upon the screener and I, hmm. I passed on it <laughs> just because just because like if you watch it all in one setting, you have nothing to do on Sunday. That's the exactly world right. Is just watching. So, I mean, and you also don't want to be that guy like oh, I already seen it. Like no one cares. So, <laughs> yeah, I just, I, I just passed on it. Yeah, you want to be there involved in like the Twitter conversation every Sunday night. Yeah. Also, Scotty's been through enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can tell, right? <laughs> um, do you have any good mic stories from your your years around the league? Uh, nothing too crazy. I think like more so. I actually uh, seen him passing through like the tunnel, like to get on like the team bus um, when he was. You know, they were the Charlotte Bobcats at yep, the time. Yep. And uh, where I was in Milwaukee, and I was like. Like had this like I had to be like taken aback like yo that's Michael Jordan but I also thought about like the chameleonaire story of like yeah. oh yo, yeah he might you know what I mean like his approach to like people just trying to get autographs and my whole thing was just trying to introduce myself and he was just not having it damn um I mean people also saw the how Michael is definitely not about autographs in episode one or two right yeah I mean his his main thing was like you you're not gonna capitalize off me. You know what I'm saying? Like, and that, that was, that was the main thing. He didn't like anybody kind of, you know, cause no one really kept those things as memorabilia or like never passed them down as heirlooms or something like that. It was always posted on like, you know, sold to like card shops and, 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 uh, and other, uh, collector, collector stores and yeah. stuff like that. So. You know, Trey, over the last probably, man, uh, seven, eight years or something like that, uh, Michael Jordan's legacy online, strictly online, on Twitter, in like, you know, social media circles has been sort of like forgotten. Obviously, like everyone gets caught up in like the here and now and LeBron and, and LeBron is like due, right? Like all props right. to him. But Michael Jordan becomes the crying meme, right? How nice right. is it? for people to rediscover and see in HD Michael Jordan's true legacy? Well, I think that people are going to like what they like regardless. You know what I mean? Like, that's that's what it is. Now, and I also, at a, at a point, understood the generation gap. And that's like me asking someone younger than us, 18, 19 years old, what is their, who are their top five rappers and they have, um, extension in it or right, something and we, right. and we frown up we have to understand the type of consumption of where where they were and where they were born and and some people grew up on kobe and some people grew up on lebron so some of these kids have never even seen michael jordan or weren't even born before his last game as a bull so um i think it's i think it's great for those 30 and above to embrace you know what i mean live relive some nostalgia and then also this is a history lesson for you know those born after 98 mm. and or or were actually you know little kids during those mid mid 90 runs so um definitely important but i think it's it's possible to like kobe lebron and jordan mm -hmm. um 
and they're all great in their own aspects. Yo, if if you consider this season a wrap, and I think we all do, it's it's hard to imagine, you know, any type of scenario where where you can get everyone back on one court and, you know, test people and, and have it be safe, regardless of whether there's an audience there or not. Um, if we consider this as this as a wrap, do you th- what's the percentage of NBA players you think right now who are staying active, staying in shape and like really keeping their skills up because it's so easy for all of us to sort of, you know, get into this mindset of this is never ending. Yeah, I mean, guys are constantly working right now, you know what I mean? Like I don't think guys are actually going to slack off or anything of that nature. I think that they're they're staying ready for the inevitable. I mean, it's all about optimism and and, and hoping that something turns for the better. Even if there is a summer season, you have to stay. You know what I mean? Because you're a professional. This is what you get paid to do. You don't slack all the way off. I mean, some guys pick up pounds and, and some guys don't. So, um, yeah, I, I think that I think that all the guys are staying active. I think one of the videos that kind of um, leaked out was Russell Russell Westbrook working out on the sand, doing some footwork stuff. Um, mm. And a lot of guys are, mm-hmm. are pretty private. You know, LeBron's uploading his uh, TI um, versed King where he's in the weight room working out. Right. So, I mean, these are what guys do 24-7, whether it's a season or not. But I think it'll take a week mm. if the season ever did start back up, and they would need some mini caps to get these guys back in shape. Trey, uh, you faced a, a, a ton of hardships through your life, personal and in different environments. What, during these times, brings you a little bit of hope when you wake up in the morning? Well, I mean, the thing is, I always tell myself, you know what I mean, like, you know, uh, it's unfortunate I lost a friend last night. Oh, um, sorry to hear that. But again, in in the op, you know, on the on the on the swing of things, I open my eyes. Everything again, like it's pandemic. It's the world is turmoil and you know sad times during these times. But anytime you look down, you say, "Oh, well, I don't got a job." Okay, but you're in a position to receive unemployment or. Um, your favorite restaurant is closed, but you have food in your refrigerator. Like there's always something, someone's always in a worse position than you are, you know? Um, and despite we're dealing with these struggles in, in, uh, the United States, there's, there's countries like Croatia that had a, a earthquake during while the COVID-19 is still hitting their country hard and people don't have homes and they have to stay with other people. So, um, just being thankful, man, you know, I, I, I didn't, I didn't grow up like poor, well, I, to my knowledge, I didn't find out I was poor until I got to college. But, mm-hmm. you know, my grandma always provided for me to to live comfortable and, and eat every night and, and still be able to, to look fresh and and and, and be a, uh, a citizen in the world. So, you know, again, just, just gratitude. That's the more thing I think that this has taught everything. And then also that materialism stuff is it's nothing. It doesn't matter whether it's yeah. looks or clothes. Yeah, I mean, like, I think that's, like, what this pandemic has sort of, like, done for a lot of people, where it's reshifted priorities. You know, you you sort of look at what people are wearing, what the things that you've spent money on in the past, and it's just like, all this is stupid. You know, like, it it's, and it's all arbitrary, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's, that's the crazy thing about it, and you also have to be mindful of, you get your stimulus check, Sales are seventy percent, eighty percent. Be wise. Not going to tell people how to, you know, spend their money and things of that nature. But just watch how how things roll out all the time. Yeah. And also, I've 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 figured out that the government has money. When oh they my god. Have money. Yeah. So That's that exactly was, that right. Was interesting. Like, yeah. It's all made up. <laughs> um, you have started an Instagram live series, uh, and it airs each Saturday evening, and it's called Growing Up the Same, and we were lucky enough to be guests on it last week. I know Guap Dad is coming up tonight when this is airing, and, uh, you and had Taylor Rooks was on. Jerry Ferrara. Um, what made you uh, come up with this concept? Because what it essentially is, is like people from different backgrounds, different uh, you know parts of the country, just different people all coming together because there is that commonality. What has what 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 birthed the idea, and also what have you gained from listening to these people tell these stories? Well, I think it came from personal experiences. You know, what I mean, me for one, meeting like all types of celebrities, and then just kind of putting them on a pedestal before meeting them, and then actually sitting down and having type of conversations, and like, yo, me too. 
a lot of relatability and I don't think that a lot of people get that get that option to be in the same room with certain people and then sometimes timing just kind of works out Mm -hmm. in certain ways and I wanted to normalize these people that we glorify you know what I mean and and like like I said it's okay to be a fan of people but then also know that they put their socks and shoes on just like you Mm -hmm. they eat just like you we're dealing with the pandemic all the same um financially they're, they're they're blessed but in certain scenarios i mean i was able to um i had wilson chandler on he expressed you know about growing up and fishing like you would think a guy like him would be only interested in basketball and other things and you know it just it just opens your world because maybe a listener was like yo during my fun times i like to go fish whether mm-hmm. no matter what race or you know uh person or age group or whatever we all have walk the same path some some sort of way so that was that was the key drive in in this series you know and also it wasn't a money grab it wasn't anything i just know that you know people were at home and and they look for entertainment and obviously uh versus and timberland and swiss beats have a good thing going yeah and in my situation i wanted to make the best of my time and, and give back to the people that support me the most i think too a, a nice uh sort of aspect to the whole thing is that it is starting with the childhood and you do ask each person who guests on there for a childhood picture and it's it's a it's a nice joy to to find you know in these dark times to see like happiness from a kid just whatever the circumstances right there on your instagram yeah absolutely i mean you know with that small 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 window you know those things are are always a, a cool experience. And then I, I learned so much, you know what I mean? I learned so much about people that I, that I never expected. You know, I always, I always tell the guests when they do come on, um, please tell me something that I couldn't Google mm. whether, you know, and yeah. it's on you, I say, look, it's never, it's never a too deep of a, too deep of an experience that you need to share, but whatever you want to share. Um, like I, I got a chance to talk to Jamal Crawford. I never knew that he was, he was born and raised in Los Angeles. I mean, he's known as a Seattle guy. Yeah, going yeah. Through. Um, but yeah, he went to high school in, in, in L.A. for two years. And that was, that took that took me aback. And then he also got in an argument with Paul Pearson, one of the barbershops he used to hang out in. So, <laughs> you know, that was that was pretty neat. You know what I mean? Through these experiences, I mean, you know, just getting to build relationships and, and things of that nature. I, I mean, I got to learn about Guap Dad on you guys' episode. Mm. And, um we have a similar background as far as, you know, um, both of our mothers, you know, um, serving time and, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and our love for our mothers and, and, and continue to, you know, bring joy to people. You know what I mean? Like he's a funny kid. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, and also a growing star in his, his career. Like I'm, I'm a fan and I'm continue to support him, you know what I mean? From afar. And I, I love his success. So, um, you know, I, I plan to, you know, dig some more stuff out of him, you know, uh, if possible, other than, you know, the character that it shows. You are also a teacher, a school teacher in Arizona. And um, I think that uh, what this time has taught parents, especially, is uh, how valuable teachers are beyond just what we all knew going to schools. Uh, do you feel that these days? Uh, to an extent. I mean, at the academy I teach at, it's I'm, I'm blessed to have a support, you know, and, uh, but sometimes it can get demanding, you know, where they expect me to do more than, you know, and like, this has never been, this has never been introduced. I mean, you know, teacher appreciation is coming up and I hope that if you know any teachers or you have teachers in your family, you support them as much as we, we support the essential workers that are, are risking their lives every day because this is, this is a task to entertain children for the time period that they're in front of a screen um and then mm. the expectations to still deliver you know what i mean that you know to to be supportive you know and have the right answers that you may not that a parent might not have for their jo- their child you know what i mean like they're yeah. lacking this today i had to sing happy birthday to a child that you know he doesn't know when his next birthday is going to be with with actual friends around so um Man. It, it, it's it's definitely gut-wrenching to, and, and disheartening to see that this is how we have to function in society right now. And, but we've adjusted. It's not just babysitting, you know, this is actually like raising humans and teaching them, yeah. you know? 
Well, but Trey, like, what has been something that's been, like, rewarding during this time um, of trying to teach kids from, from afar? Like, has there been anything, or is it just, like, this is just a much harder task than you, than you had been? No, I mean, I, my, my kids are great, man. I think the entire, you know, community of our school has just been really receptive, and we hit the ground running. We were probably one of the first schools in Arizona, not yet alone the United States, to... Um, do online learning and and, and the, the rewarding part is that every morning no matter they if they they're grumpy or they didn't get any sleep they're excited to talk to me they're excited to see their friends the energy is there the respect level is there the work is being completed no, no assignments are being ignored and you know as as we're closing on the school year man it's it's just been a joy to teach certain kids you know so um, I'm very blessed and very fortunate um, to have a, a job and then also to um, to educate the youth. You know, I'm dealing with six through nine year olds and it's not an easy task. It's not an easy task. I think the, the highlight of it is them figuring out what emojis are <laughs> and learning how to send. Um, sometimes I have to disable the chat, but I mean, it, it's great as innocent as it is. You know what I mean? Which adults, we just send them as normal text message um, emotions and things of that nature, but this is this has been a fun experience. You know, them them sharing different combos and and trying to come up of unique ways to communicate. Trey, do you know what your summer is going to look like personally? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I haven't thought that far ahead. Yeah, you know, yeah. Lord willing, you know, what I mean, with with how crazy things are, um, I I pray that I I, I make it to summer and and, and beyond. But also um, more discovery, more teaching myself about things, more phone calls to to friends and relatives, um, and you know if we're continued to be on lockdown, um, staying safe, um, following soup. Hopefully, uh, I'm able to create more work and content with people, and and that's pretty much it, man. That's it. I I, I can't ask for more. Drinking a lot of water and, and there you go, and, yeah, and, and hopefully being able to uh, play some pickup ball, you know, eventually when this thing calms down a bit. I miss basketball so much. Yeah, I mean, like, how are you feeling? Are you, are you being active in any way, or are you just like stuck inside? Like, are you able to go for walks? Like, where? Tell me, like, I what did. It's like. I did see that that Big Waz was saying it was going to be ninety seven in the valley. Oh, then no, and then and then Trey was like, oh yeah, add one for the desert. Oof. Yeah, I mean, so I'm used to the heat. I don't think that the heat really stops me from doing what I need to do. Um, I, I live by a lakeside, so I'm just, you know, kind of walking. And, you know, I reward myself every Friday. So I'm, I'm practicing social distance, uh, social distancing throughout the week, throughout the week. And then after uh, I wrap up with my uh, study hall today, I'm going to go on a walk before I talk to Guap Dad. Um, and get my two mile walk in and then come back in. So, you know, the, vi- you know, cause I, you don't get vitamin D cooped up in the house. Yeah. And, um, uh, those, those are the rewarding things. And just, uh, just being able to, to, to appreciate everything. You know what I mean? Like, this is the thing. I feel like I'm either playing overseas or I'm in doing a jail sentence. Mm. <laughs> so, um, yeah, just, just being able to be positive and, and, and focused on a lot of things. That, that are more that are more important. Absolutely. Trey, we love you. Take care of yourself down there. Keep doing amazing work, both uh, online and over Zoom. And uh, we'll be checking in on you. Stay safe down there and uh, and be well. I love you guys too. Um, and also, before I go, um, to watch Growing Up the Same, um, at Trevon Edwards, at T-R-A-V-O-N-N-E, E D W A R D S and at Trevon uh, on Twitter. Thank you guys so much. No doubt. Thank we'll you. talk to you soon. All right. Shout out to Black Trey. Shout out to Mary HK Troy. And shout out to Sean Fennessy. Jeff, are we back tomorrow? We are back every day forever. As always, guys, not for real, for real. Sure, sure. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Right.